So, you know, uh, I really, really love the story of Ruth. Uh, her story uh, actually starts with her mother and father-in-law leaving Bethlehem during a time of famine going to a place called Moab in order to, to farm in that place where they weren't having as much trouble. And uh, while they were there, her mother and father-in-law had two sons, um, and then those two sons married two women, Moabite women, and they, Ruth is one of those women that gets married. And over the course of the next 10 years, all of the men in the family die. And this is kind of a significant problem because back in those days, your worth as a woman was kind of garnered on if you had a man in your life. So uh, this is essentially a, 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 a social death sentence to these women. And so Naomi, the mother-in-law, says to Ruth and her sister-in-law, hey, you guys should go back to Moab, find, find you guys some nice young men, and I'm going to go back to Bethlehem and... Yeah, we should just part ways. And both of them protest. They say, no, we're not doing that. And then she says it again. You guys, you really need to do that. And so what the sister-in-law leaves, but Ruth says to Naomi, Naomi, I'm staying with you. Your people will be my people. Your God will be my God. And so uh, the story continues. Ruth and Naomi travel back to Bethlehem where they are hungry. So uh, Ruth or Naomi has this idea. She's like, I have this family this man in my family who has a big field, his name's Boaz, and you should go uh, collect wheat uh, from his field. And so um, she, Naomi go, or Ruth goes and collects wheat in the field, and Boaz notices all her hard work and hears about all that she's been doing for uh, Naomi. And uh, Boaz calls Ruth. He's like, hey, you know, I'm going to give you this food and this extra grain. And um, by the end of the day, Ruth has all this huge amount of food, and the story continues, and eventually we get to a point where Naomi has this eye-opening moment where she's like, Ruth, Boaz is our kinsman redeemer, which in this time was, if there was no sons in a family, it was this guy's job to produce sons as heirs for the man who died. So he's our kinsman redeemer, why don't you go and inquire as to if he's willing to fulfill that role? And she goes, and there's this like weird thing where she un does the blanket from his toes. I don't really understand it, but it happens. And he, he says, hey, you know, Ruth, I'm totally willing, but there's this other guy who's actually closer. Let me see if he wants to do that. And the other guy, he decides, no, I don't really want to do that. And so Boaz takes Ruth as his wife, and they produce a son whose name is Obed. And Obed produces Jesse, and Jesse produces David, and David becomes the great, 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 generations and generations, grandfather of Jesus. So I love this story because it reveals the father's heart. Not only was Ruth a widow and like in deep need of the help of God, but she was this Moabite woman, not even part of the family of God, but God grafted her in and chose her as a great, 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 great grandfather, grandmother of Jesus which is just a phenomenal, phenomenal thing about our God. Will you pray with me? Father God, we love you. You are an amazing God. We lift your name on high. Thank you so much for just being awesome. Lord, I pray that this time would be given over to you, God, that because of this time there would be kingdom impact. In Jesus' name, amen. Happy New Year. Happy New Year. You guys must all be the best Christians since you woke up early and came to church. <laughs> I'm working on six and a half hours, and I'm used to getting like eight and a half, so sorry if I'm a little bit odd. Um, my name is Nathan, and I'm 23 years old. I'm married to my wife, Taylor, and uh, she is an amazing woman of God, and I am so blessed to have her in my life. The most important thing you need to know about me is that Jesus has utterly transformed my life uh, he is the reason that I am the man I am today. Today I want to talk about the Father's heart. I want to ask three questions. What is our Father's heart? How do we gain our Father's heart? And what does having God's heart look like as we engage with the world around us? So uh, without any further ado, let's dive in. So what is our Father's heart? 
You know, as with anyone in this room, God's heart is extremely complex. And there's no way in the next five to seven minutes that I could describe all of it to you. And there's probably no way even given decades and decades, maybe even centuries of time, that I could fully describe God's heart to you. Uh, Probably only God could do that. But I think we can hit some general ideas. The first general idea I would like to talk about is God's heart is for his creation. The whole of the story of God reveals that God loves his creation. He most predominantly loves people, and even more predominantly than that, his people. In uh, the creation accounts in Genesis 1 and Genesis 2, we discover a God who is not like other gods. In other creation accounts of other religions, we discover that creation is kind of a result of a, a chaotic thing that, um, the, the, you know, whatever, the gods got angry at each other and they fought and all of a sudden there was a mountain range and blah, 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 blah. That's not the creation account in Christianity. In Christianity, God says it was good. He takes chaos. It, the, the, in, in Genesis 1, we see that there's nothingness. There's, there's just emptiness and, and chaos. And he, po- sorry, he forms it into order. And we see God's heart for his people here as well. Because in both Genesis 1 and Genesis 2, which are kind of two corresponding accounts of the creation narrative, creation culminates at humanity. God's heart is, God's heart for his creation is also revealed in the gospel. From the fall of man to what will eventually be the resurrection of the dead into the coming kingdom of God, God has been pursuing and redeeming his people. In the beginning, we were created to be with God. When we sinned, it separated us from God. But God did not allow that separation to remain. He pursued us with everything he had. And eventually he pursued us in Jesus. And in his birth, cross, resurrection, and eventual return, we see that God has been totally with us. Thus God's heart is for his creation, for people, for us. God values his people. He holds us up. He makes himself known to us. How phenomenal is that? That God, the God of the universe, cares to make himself known to you. Number two, God's heart is for the lowly and the humble. You don't have to look very far in Scripture to find God lifting up the humble and the lowly and the downtrodden. When God chose Abraham in Genesis, it wasn't because Abraham was somebody. It was actually because he was nobody that God chose him according to Deuteronomy 7.7, paraphrase. We also see Moses, this kind of murderous, speech impediment guy being used by God to free all of Israel. David, king over Israel, had an adulterous relationship, murdered the husband, but God still calls him a man after his own heart, and he becomes the great-great-grandfather of Jesus. Ruth, we already talked about. Rahab, this prostitute who was in the city of Jericho, God used her to protect the spies that that the Israelites sent into Jericho, and she let them out by another, another way, according to James. And she becomes this integral part of that whole story of the Canaanite conquest. In Matthew 9, we read, uh, Later, Matthew invited Jesus and his disciples to his home as dinner guests, along with many tax collectors and other disreputable sinners. But when the Pharisees saw this, they asked him, They asked his disciples, why does your teacher eat with such scum? When Jesus heard this, he said, healthy people don't need a doctor. Sick people do. Then he added, now go and learn the meaning of this scripture. I I want you to show mercy, not offer sacrifices. For I have come to call not those who think they are righteous, but those who know they are sinners. Jesus was with these people. All 12 of the disciples, Matthew, this tax collector guy, he was against the the people of Israel for all intensive purposes. Jesus calls him, and he eventually writes this, oh, this is phenomenal. He eventually writes Matthew, right? And Matthew is this uniquely Jewish form of the gospel. So Matthew, a traitor to his people, the Jews, wrote the bridge of the, the gospel bridge that works the best with Jews. Isn't that phenomenal? I think that's cool. Okay, anyway. Timothy was young. Philemon was a slave. 
In James 1, it says, let the humble rejoice in their exaltation and the rich in their humiliation. And that's nowhere near a complete list of all the characters. God over and over again chooses to use the weak more than the strong. He chooses to be with the downtrodden, with the lowly. Number three, God's heart is love. In 1 John 4, we read, God is love. And anyone who does not love does not know God because God is love. Love is at the center of the teachings of Jesus. In Mark 12, 28 through 31, we learn uh, of a moment when a scribe, who's this extremely learned man, he spent his days copying scripture, word for word, uh, quotation for quotation, every dot and tittle. Um, and so he became a very learned man doing this. And he comes up to Jesus and he says, you know, Jesus, what's the greatest commandment? And Jesus, quoting to him out of the Old Testament, out of Deuteronomy chapter 6, the great Shema, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. And he adds, love your neighbor as yourself. Jesus even goes beyond that. In the Sermon on the Mount, he says, You have heard that it was said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I tell you, love your enemy. Pray for those who persecute you. Jesus takes love to a whole new dimension. Love plays a major role in all of God's actions. From creation to redemption to the culmination of all time, love is at the center of it all. It's all about God's desire to be with us. So big idea number one. God's heart is a heart of love and a heart that is for his people. He does not look down on the weak or the lost, but seeks them and chooses to be with them and often uses them to accomplish his will. So the second question I want to ask is how to gain the Father's heart. I think this is simple from an ideological perspective, but complex from a practical perspective. Uh, I think that the key to living as a man or woman of God, a man or woman after God's own heart, is intimacy with him. Yes. The whole of the Christian life hinges on intimacy yes. with the Father. How did God create us in the beginning? We already said it. He created us to be with him in intimacy. We walked with him in the garden. What happened when we fell? We were separated from him. Then Jesus came and ushered in a new system whereby through him we could have intimacy with God again. And when the end does come, this is a beautiful picture. When the end does come in Revelation, we read that the, there will be a new heavens and the new earth, and God is going to bring his, his kingdom to earth and declare God is making his dwelling place with man. It's, an, it's excellent. It's amazing. God is bringing what, what began in the garden, in the Garden of Eden, that's this beautiful picture of, of God and us together, will culminate in the end, in the new kingdom, in the, in the new heavens and the new earth, with God and us together again perfectly. In Galatians uh, 6, 7 through 8, it reads, Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For wh whatever one sows, that will he also reap. For the one who shows to his own, sows to his own flesh will from the flesh reap corruption, but the one who sows in the Spirit will from the Spirit reap eternal life. When we invest in the flesh, our actions are fleshly. Our actions are going to be sinful. When you put in America's Got Talent, you're going to get out America's Got Talent. When you put in Jesus, you're going to get out Jesus, when you put in the word of God, you're going to get out the word of God. What you sow into your, into your spirit, you're also going to reap out of it. In Galatians 5, 19 through 23, we're given a list to know whether or not we're walking in the spirit or walking in the flesh. Here's what it says. When you follow the desires of your sinful nature, the results are very clear. Sexual immorality, impurity, lustful pleasures, idolatry, sorcery, hostility, quarreling, jealousy, outbursts of anger, selfish ambition, dissension, division, envy, drunkenness, wild parties, and other sins like these. Let me tell you again, as I have before, that anyone living that sort of life will not inherit the kingdom of God. But 
the Holy Spirit produces this kind of fruit in our lives. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. There is no law against these things. So, gaining the Father's heart comes down to investing in Him. When we, it comes down to sowing Him into our lives. Some really high-quality ways to do this, I think, pray, read your Bible, spend quiet time alone with God, go to church, be obedient when He leads you to be obedient, be worshipful in your life. You know, whenever I give a list like this, I'm always a little bit wary because our culture loves to check things off of a list. It's like, guys, the pastor said that I should read my Bible, so I'm going to just go, you know, open the Bible, read some stuff, and check that off the list. I don't think that that's the heart that God desires we go into this with. Uh, when I was uh, doing premarital counseling with Taylor, uh, I had this attitude, like, Okay, so as part of premarital counseling, we got homework, and uh, I really, really, really just wanted to get the homework done. I just wanted to accomplish the task of getting the homework done. I didn't really care about the process, but Taylor was like, Nathan, we need to invest in this. We need to have time in this, and I'm so thankful that she did because we would not have gotten one-tenth of what we got out of premarital counseling if it hadn't been for her insisting that we spend time on it. It's not just a task, it's something that we're investing in for the good of our marriage. You know, uh, when I was in my second year of college, I experienced intimacy with God for the very first time in my whole life, and it was amazing. Uh, I uh, remember getting up from my desk one night, walking over to my closet, sitting down in my closet, and just praying this simple prayer, you know, Lord, I don't have any idea how to be close to you, how to be intimate with you. I don't have any idea how to pray. Will you teach me? And God did. And over the course of the next three months, he brought me deeper and deeper into intimacy with him, and I was seeing crazy things happen. God put this deep, deep, deep hunger in me for him. It was like, you know how people like dread reading their Bible? It was like, man, I can't wait to spend some time with Jesus. Like, and I'm not even exaggerating, like I really felt that way. Um, and uh, anyway, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so my, as I grew in intimacy with him, my heart's desire increasingly became him. I wanted to spend time with him. Uh, this went on for a few months, and um, at, at the end of it, I, I look, uh, looking back, I, I saw as God uh, accomplished miracles, I saw as God uh, took kind of me as like this really uh, socially awkward, just full of social anxiety guy, and turned me into a guy who's even who was even willing to tell the gospel to a random person on the street. It was a transformation that only the Holy Spirit could do. It wasn't me. So uh, I had, over the course of these same months, I had kind of met this girl, not Taylor, and uh, we, I, over time I had started to trade time alone with God for time alone with this girl, and what ended up happening was, this girl became God in my life, and it utterly destroyed me. That relationship ended, and I remember the day it did because I threw up in the trash can because I was so emotionally, like, upheavaled, if that's okay word to use. Um, I was brokenhearted. I was just broken, broken. And uh, I was like, well, I should probably go back to God. And so I went into my prayer closet, but it was different. And for a year, I languished before the Lord wondering, wondering, God, what, what are you doing here? Like, what, what's going on? And God, a year later, not because he was keeping me from hearing, but probably because I wasn't listening, uh, a year later, he kind of reached in my life and he said, you know, Nathan, when all of this started, at the very beginning, when we first experienced intimacy with each other, your goal was me. Your desire was me. You were trying to seek me. And ever since the relationship with that girl ended, you have stopped seeking me and started seeking everything that it felt like. You started seeking the miracles and you started seeking the emotions and you started seeking all of that and you forgot your first love. It was eye-opening to me. And in that moment, in that same moment, God asked me this question. He's like, do you really want me? Do you really want Jesus? 
And that question has become the cornerstone of my relationship with Jesus. The cornerstone of my relationship with Jesus. Because when I'm deciding whether or not to watch America's Got Talent or spend some time alone with the Lord, I remember that question. Nathan, do you really want me? So, the important thing is, is what is the end goal We were talking about lists at the beginning of this story. The important thing is that the end goal of that list is Jesus, not reading your Bible. That list, praying, reading your Bible, etc., 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 those are tools, not tasks. Tools to gain intimacy with the Father. That was a really helpful uh, idea for me. So that brings us to big idea number two. As followers of Jesus, it ought to be our goal to be people after God's heart. The way we gain a heart like God's is through intimacy with Him. Intimacy comes by spending time alone with God in prayer, or scripture, or church, or silence, or worshipfulness, or obedience, and more. It's important for us to not allow these tools to become tasks. Rather, they are means to an end, and that end is Jesus. So, What does having God's heart look like as we engage in the world? That's our final question. I want to break this out into two categories. Uh, But before we get too far in that, uh, I want to just say this. As we gain intimacy with the Father, it is my absolute belief that we will start to see that these actions that I'm going to talk about become more natural. It becomes more natural for us to love one another. It it becomes our go-to thing when we're intimate with Jesus. That scripture that says you reap what you sow, when you reap, when you sow Jesus, you're going to reap Jesus. When you sow not Jesus, you're going to reap not Jesus. And so as we grow in intimacy, it's my firm belief that these things become more natural. So first, let's talk about believers. God instructs us to love one another in John 13, 34. He instructs us to maintain unity in the bond of peace in Ephesians 4, 3. He instructs us to uplift and encourage one another in 1 Thessalonians 5, 11. He tells us to serve one another, John 13. He tells us to be devoted to one another in brotherly love, to honor one another above ourselves, to live in harmony and not be proud in Romans 12. In Romans 14 and 15, we are instructed to not judge one another and to be completely humble and gentle, be patient, full of compassion and forgiveness in Ephesians 4. And the list goes on. If we are seeking to be men and women with the Father's heart, then we must, must, must be loving and honoring to one another. There is no room for pride, harsh judgment, contempt, or division. God's word is extremely clear. So, you know... I think that this church has a couple of people who are really, really good at loving one another in the church. And those of you who have been blessed to have a conversation with one of them know exactly who I'm talking about. They're the people who, uh, when they see you, you know that you've been seen. When they ask you, how are you doing? They actually mean, how are you really doing? They take time to listen to you. These people are a gift to our congregation. And I think we ought to strive to be like they are, honestly. Well, we should strive to be like Jesus is, but they're a really good representation of how Jesus is. In John 13, it says, They will know you by your love for one another. In this, we can usher in the Father's heart. We can usher the Father's heart into our church, into our congregation, into our families by being authentic but full of love. Not gossiping, full of compassion, not harsh judgment, but loving correction. I also want to talk about how this deals with unbelievers. Our Father has a deep, deep heart for those who do not know Him. He stands as the father of the prodigal son, watching and waiting for unbelievers to return to him. And when he sees them coming at them, he runs and embraces them. And if we love God, it is our duty to love non-believers also. 
You know, this year I've sat in these chairs, these same chairs as you, and listened to sermons on Sunday mornings, and uh, I hear the call again and again, go, 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 go preach the gospel to your friends, go preach the gospel to your neighbors, go tell your family, go tell, go tell everybody you can. We have heard it so many times this year, so many times this year, so I don't need to tell you again to go. But I also know, and you know, I, I think that there are a lot of us in this room who have spent this time doing that. We've spent 2016 being lives on purpose for Jesus, that we have gone and shared the gospel with our neighbors, that we have gone and, and, and you know, whatever. We've, we've shared the gospel with our family. We have gone. But I also know that there are a lot of us sitting in these chairs today, me included on some occasions, who have been disobedient to the prompting of the Holy Spirit, and we have not done that. I'm sitting in both camps. This last year, you know, I had this opportunity to participate because of the way that my job evolved this year. I had an opportunity to participate in a lot of conferences and a lot of trainings, and uh, one of the trainings that I went to was put on by the Covenant Denomination, and uh, I went to this thing. It was called like the annual ministry celebration. Um, and I went and sat in on a seminar that was about church planting. And I didn't really particularly think that I would ever be a church planter, more that I just didn't want to listen to whatever was going on in the other seminar. And it proved to be a, a good choice. Um, as I was sitting, I was listening to various pastors as they talked about their church plants. And one of them a uh, pastor and his wife from, uh, or a pastor and a pastor wife, like they're both pastors, uh, from Fort Collins. They said, you know, in our church plant, we're really trying to transition what we consider to be evangelism. We're trying to redefine that. And then they used this word. They said, we think that the evangelism in our country has been become very conversion centric. So people have become obsessed in evangelism with getting that person to believe what I think. It's all about the conversion. And they said, the gospel is not conversion-centric. It's Christocentric. It's Jesus-centric. And I just about wanted to leap out of my chair and yell, amen. It was so, it's so true, so real, so act, it is very accurate. So I think that, you know, many of us, when we hear this word of evangelism, we... We think about the Denny's waitress and we say, man, it is my job to convert that lady to Christianity. But I think, and I mean, I'm not saying that God can't use you to do that, because absolutely he can. And if the Holy Spirit is telling you to do that, you definitely should do that. But I think that we're going at it with the wrong heart if our goal is conversion. We have to readjust, readjust our focus. If conversions are not at the center of the gospel and Jesus is, then shouldn't it be our goal to reveal Jesus so that people may come to know him rather than reveal Christianity? In 1 Corinthians 3, Paul tells the believers in Corinth that God is the one who grows the seeds of the word of God that are planted by people. It is God who, that's paraphrase, sorry. It is God who saves people. It is God who calls them to ourselves. Our job is to reveal Jesus so that they might come to know Jesus and tell the truth. So I've been pondering this idea for quite some time now. And uh, I came upon this idea at, during a time of quiet kind of prayer and stuff. And uh, I think it's going to really help me to be healthier, excuse me, evangelistically. And uh, to give you a context, I'm an itinerant, independent itinerant missionary from this church. So uh, this church supports me to be a missionary in other countries three to four times a year, and I go to the same places over and over again in order to build relationships and stuff. But uh, because of that's my job title, I feel this ridiculous level of pressure to tell the gospel to everybody I meet, to the lady at Subway and to the person on the plane next to me and all this stuff. And I'm not so sure that's what, I mean, sometimes it's the Holy Spirit, but sometimes I think it's just me putting myself under this pressure because it's my job title. And so I, I, I kind of formulated this word, or I think the Holy Spirit maybe. Uh, the word is intentionality. I think instead of walking out of church today feeling like, boy, oh boy, I need to go convert some people to Christianity, 
that we ought to be walking out of here thinking, I need to be more intentional about revealing Jesus to those around me in what I say and in what I do so that they may come to know him. Now, if the Holy Spirit is knocking on your heart, like I said, to preach the gospel to that lady at Denny's, you better do it. But, um, uh, yeah, I'm not saying that's bad or wrong. Rather, I think that there are many of us in here who are so intimidated to share the word of God, to share the gospel, and we feel this pressure that if we don't, if we do share the gospel and they don't convert, then we're somehow a failure that we end up doing nothing at all. And I think that is unacceptable. I think that God frowns on that. So, here's what I was thinking. We make a commitment to one another to be intentional about revealing Christ to those around us in what we do and in what we say. One of us plants, another of us waters, God brings the growth. So I think it's still kind of heady at this point. So here's some examples. Next time you go out to eat at a sit-down restaurant, be like Jesus was with Zacchaeus. Make eye contact with the waiter. Use their name when speaking to them. And saying thank you. Give them encouraging words. We're not inventing stuff here. It's just what Jesus did already. Follow Jesus is teaching to bless those who persecute you the next time someone cuts you off in traffic. Play, pray a blessing over them instead of cursing at them. Make like Jesus was with the woman at the well when you're dealing with people in your family, friend group, at work, or in any other aspect of your life, and choose to really see them. I went to this conference in high school, and the guy said, Choose to really see people in full living color. Not just black and white images in our world, but see people as they actually are. They are people. They're full. They have hopes and dreams and desires. If you need more examples, just dive into the Bible. Jesus shows us on multiple, multiple, multiple occasions that this is what we ought to be doing. And he gives us lots of examples of how to do it. And here at the end, we return once again to the beginning in knowing and doing the Father's heart and knowing and doing the heart of Jesus. And it all starts with intimacy because without intimacy, you got nothing. I'm I, I, I will stand on this rock that if you have no intimacy with Jesus, you have no Christian life. You are not experiencing what God intended Christianity to be, what God intended following him to be. If you have no intimacy with him, that needs to change. Yeah, like, not, not, not as some work or whatever, but like seriously, you're not experiencing what Jesus intends for you. He is so much bigger than this. I mean, God uses the church in, I mean, it's so awesome to be a part of it, but he's so much bigger than Sunday mornings. He's so much bigger than Wednesday nights. He's so much bigger. He's so, he, man, I was singing uh, the song, uh, How Good Is the Father's Love or whatever, the song that we were singing about Jesus loves was. Anyway, uh, and it hit me that God is smiling down from heaven on us. And, you know, even as I speak, and I'm not always the best speaker, and you guys are all listening, and you're like, man, this guy's crazy. God's still smiling on us because he cares to be... Because he cares to be intimate with us. Because he loves us so much. All right, so big idea number three. In a more than slightly altered paraphrase of the famous words of Francis of Assisi, preach the gospel always in all that you do and all that you say. And when it is necessary, come right out and say it. Our Father has a complex heart that is passionate about his creation, passionate about people, passionate about his followers. As his followers, it is our privilege to seek after his heart. We seek his heart by being intimate with him, seeking God, using tools like prayer, scripture, quiet time, and worshipfulness. As we grow closer to God, the fruit of the flesh becomes less, and the fruit of the Spirit becomes more. And as we go about our daily lives, we can become ambassadors for Jesus as we Bear his heart and choose to be intentional about revealing that heart in our lives to those around us 
in all that we say, and in all that we do. Let us be men and women who bear the heart of our Father. We're going to go to our offering now, but will you pray with me? <coughs> Lord, you are so worthy. You are the name above all other names. You are worthy of praise. Uh, we desire you. God, I pray that if there's anybody in this room right now who does not yet know the intimacy that you are capable of providing, I pray that you would make that happen. Lord, that we would not rest until we seek you with all of our hearts. As it said that in, in, in Jeremiah 29, 13, seek me and you will find me because you seek me with your whole heart. Lord, you're good and we love you. In Jesus' name, amen.